The last innovation I want to see is the Hollis bag with the uh, zipper that doesn't catch the tzitzit. <laughs> how, how appropriate for these uh, comments today. Uh, I'm gonna do this all over again. Mort, if you want to email it to me, I can post it for you. No, what happened is I had sent you that private uh, chat and it went into the private chat. It should be there now for everyone. Got it. Everyone should have a document called electric and electronic devices. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I got it. I just downloaded it. Okay. Uh, can you see it on the screen? Yeah. All right. Okay, this is uh, continuing our ongoing discussion. Um, you know, <clears throat> we got, what we've done so far is um, discussed the different approaches to halachic decision-making uh, by orthodoxy, uh, four, well, actually three different schools in the conservative movement, Reconstructionists and Reform. Okay? Okay. So since our original question is, how did we come up with the permission to zoom on Shabbat, um, we're moving now towards understanding what these teshuva are really about. And I thought that in order to uh, really understand the one on Zooming, first we have to understand what the Committee on, law and, on Jewish Law and Standards has decided about the use of electricity and electronic devices. Okay. Where, where do these guys stand? Which, uh, which one of the conservative you know, streams does this go into? One, two, three, or four? I'm going to leave that for this uh, question to be decided as we go along. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just a hint, the fact that the vote was not unanimous, they're obviously in different places. Okay. So this one, this um, <clears throat> teshuva was written by Rabbi Daniel Nevins and um, was approved by the CJLS in, 19, in 2012, uh, a vote of 17 to two to two. You know, 17 in favor, two opposed, and two abstaining. And at the beginning of his response, he starts with this quote from, uh, from Rabbi Heschel. In the tempestuous ocean of time and toil, there are islands of stillness where man may enter a harbor and reclaim his dignity. The island is the seventh day, the Sabbath, the day of detachment from things, instruments, and practical affairs, as well as attachment to the spirit. Um, Can you scroll up a little bit? I don't see it. I don't, yeah, I don't see it. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the top of the page. Uh, it's towards the bottom of the first page. I don't have oh, the first page. They're looking at what you posted on your share screen, which is, I think, well into the... Uh, oh, you just got the, uh, the one it, that's, that has that's, no... It has no... You have this one, prior studies? Prior studies, yes. Uh, it was, I thought it was giving me both. All right, hold on. Let me go back here. Okay. Do you have, do you have it now? 
No. 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 My screen screen is, is well, let's start it again. It said it was paused. Ah, yes. that yes. Is so, this is the beginning, yes. This is the beginning. <laughs> Do you remember what was that their first uh, space movie, um, and and at the end it says this is the end of the beginning. Uh, oh, with Michael Rennie in nineteen fifty, that one. Something like oh. that. What was the name of it? Um, it was the day the Earth planet? stood still. Day the Earth stood still. Was that it? Oh yeah, day the Earth stood still. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Lots to Barada Nikto. Right. Anyway. Here we go. Here's the beginning. All right. Here's the quote by <laughs> the quote by Rabbi Heschel here at the you know, after it says response. Okay. Now, the flick of a switch. This action, so effortless and casual, is nonetheless a powerful marker or marker of modernity. The switch completes or breaks a circuit, unleashing or suspending the flow of electrons which power every conceivable type of machine. With electricity, we control our physical environment, altering the shape and structure of objects and yielding light and dark, heat and cold, sound and silence, and innumerable other environmental adaptations. Elect electrical motors move people and objects in every direction, enabling those with, ability, with disabilities to function more further. I can't even read to function more fully and all to avoid unwanted exertion. Motion sensors are increasingly embedded in appliances such as public sinks, toilets, lights and doors, and security cameras have proliferated, making it challenging to function in modern buildings without an electronic transaction. We use electricity to control not only our physical reality, but also the digital information was, which is in integral to contemporary life. All right, how's that for a start? Uh, <laughs> I, I, every time I look at something like this, I'm reminded that when I was at Penn Hillel and we put in a um, security system which had motion detectors throughout the building, and every time somebody walked by one, a, a light on the panel went on. Boy, did I have trouble from the Orthodox guy because that meant they're walking in the building on Shabbat, turned on those lights, and we tried covering the sensors, uh, the, the panel over, it didn't work. Cover, you know, putting cardboard over the sensors didn't work. Um, finally, we had to put a switch on the main control so it would turn the whole thing off. And then once somebody found that out, they broke into the building. <laughs> of course. Mort, there's, a, there's another issue potentially here that I find even more troubling. Um, is, is, is what's at issue here the movement of, of electrons and it's moving electrons that potentially violate Shabbat? Uh, that is a question that will be addressed. Um, the answer ultimately is no, but that question will be addressed. Okay. okay because the, the, the problem is if, you, if, if moving electrons violate Shabbat, then we have to die for Shabbat. <laughs> well, that's why I said the answer is no. <laughs> Good. I mean, it's, it's, considered, it's considered and rejected. Okay. But... Um, I want to go back the the document that you originally had, which I'm not going to try to bring up on the screen, but I just want to point out what that was talking about was actually a footnote to um, to these the passage I just read, and it says prior studies regarding electricity and Shabbat within the conservative movement begin with Rabbi Arthur Newlander's 1950 responsum the use of electricity on Shabbat. He argues that the use of electricity cannot be compared to lighting fire on either halachic or scientific grounds, and that the use of electrical appliances should be banned only in those instances where the result is a malacha or action 
and the action is not in consonant with the spirit of Shabbat. And much has changed in the subsequent 61 years. So we, that's why we have a completely new response. Just, let me just um, point out that what Rabbi Newlander did looked at the idea that one of the specifically mentioned prohibited activities on Shabbat is the lighting of fire. And he asked the question, is the turning on of electricity and electric lights lighting, lighting fire? And if so, is the prohibition of against fire, is it because it creates a light, it, it uh, gives off heat, or it consumes the fuel that is uh, causing the fire, you know, be it wood or gas or whatever, uh, or coal. Um, so we're going to just acknowledge that that was part of the, uh, or even when I was in, uh, in school, that was the, um, one of the main points of discussion we had when talking about the use of electricity. Okay. Doesn't that go against the whole the whole spirit of of the laws about that? Because I mean, we're looking, we seem to be looking at the outcome here. Whether something constitutes prohibited work um, depends on on what the outcome is, whether it generates light or generates heat, as opposed to how much effort is being expended on doing the activity. Well, I was, that's a very quick summation of, you know, that I gave you of, of his uh, teshuva back in 1950. Um, I don't want to jump to conclusions right now because one, we're going to uh, pick it apart uh, in different ways. Um, and it may seem that we jumped to a conclusion because I did. Uh, without wanting to take up, uh, it would take us all our session today just to go through his old teshuva. And I'm convinced now that we're not gonna get through this one today too. This one is 57 pages. So, right. so in any event, um, I I'm gonna say to you, yes, but we're gonna, gonna go through that and, and deal with it, and, you know, as we go on. Okay. So, there's just still a couple introductory notes. As we will see, Shabbat fosters a different state of consciousness through its detailed regulation of human behavior. Each action is analyzed through two lenses. Is it malacha? the type of work prohibited by halakha? And does it undermine Shavuot, the positive obligation to rest on Shabbat? This paper will examine these questions and will lead us to conclusions which are grounded in tradition and reflect the realities of contemporary technology and culture. Okay, so let me just make sure that we're clear on what he's pointing out here. That there are two aspects to the observance of Shabbat that we need to be mindful of. The first is malacha. The Torah says on Shabbat and on some of the holidays, you should not do malacha. The Torah does not define hala'a malacha. That's going to be the whole issue at hand, or it has been the issue at hand, um, shall we say, since the time the Torah was promulgated. Uh, you know, leaving out the issue, was it at Sinai or later, later on? But whatever it was, this has been an issue. We do not, it does not give us exactly what we mean by Malacha. Mort, um, quick question. How, how is, the, the, the notion of malacha uh, connected to the activities uh, during the six days of creation in Bereshit? Um, 
It's not. The, okay. You know, in the sense that the activities of creation are, are really um, overbearing. You know, they're, you know, it says God created, you know, the heavens and the earth. You know, how do we translate that into a Malachan and Shabbat? Um, we, we are saying that, you know, uh, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, therefore it's Shabbat. Um, but I don't think we relate it directly to specific, specific, oh, I got a better answer. The first chapter of Shema, of Breshit, uh, makes a big point, and the rabbis and various other sources say that God created by speaking. Mm. You know, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, mm. And and most of, you know, so therefore, to compare the work that we do to God speaking and it was done, I don't think is uh, feasible or within the realm of uh, human uh, undertaking. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me move on a little bit here. But I mean, that's that's a little self-serving, isn't it, Mort? Go ahead. No, I just I just can't imagine the rabbis coming up with a, a conclusion that would prohibit their speaking on Shabbat. If we prohibit what? I... That would prohibit their speaking on Shabbat. Okay. <laughs> um, Good one. <laughs> yeah, yes. Time. Time a rabbi's sermon and then come back with that one. <laughs> um, you know, that's not a comment to the sermon we had this past Shabbat. <laughs> it was good, just long. All right. Um, all right. For many Sabbath observers, the flick of an electrical switch is tandemat to chilu Shabbat desecration of Shabbat. This is such a profound transgression that may be considered a capital offense, although Judaism has not practiced the death penalty for two millennia. <laughs> the identification as a Shomer Shabbat, a Sabbath observance, is in many circles associated with rendering electrical switches inaccessible or inoperative on Friday afternoon and the setting of timers to adjust lights and other appliances at necessary. Nevertheless, other Shabbat observant Jews make distinctions between electrical appliances whose operation they find to be permitted and those which they deem prohibited. Such people claim that it is possible to avoid forbidden activities and to achieve the necessary state of tranquility on Shabbat, even while making limited use of electricity. For example, dozens of Orthodox rabbis have endorsed a special light switch that is designed to, for, to avoid forbidden labor and is promoted under this, the slogan, control electric, electricity on Shabbos. Notice it's Shabbos, Shabbos not Shabbos. Yes, yeah. The Zomed Institute in Israel has provided <coughs> specially designed public telephones, computer key keyboards to allow Shabbat observers to gain access to data while violating the laws of Shabbat. Some may shun the use of electricity unless it is indicated by another Jewish value, such as assisting people who are ill, frail, or disabled, performing necessary military services, avoiding great exertion and waste on Shabbat, or preventing animal suffering. Okay, that's a real broad statement here. Uh, by the way, the Zomed Institute, is, I mentioned it last week, about their new devices, the uh, the infrared thermometer, which pulses every four seconds, so you don't have to turn it on. It's always going. All right, but so even before we get to distinguish, you know, which part of conservative Judaism we're talking about, um, Nevins is pointing out that even within orthodoxy, 
there's differences of opinion um, as to um, how much how much we should preset electricity or not. Uh, let me point out that um, Carmi has, we always look to Carmi's cousins, you know, it's good to have some real super from family and super from family, people in the family, so we can point out some of their practices. But they will not open their refrigerator unless the motor is running. You know, the motor is constantly going, you know, the temperature inside the refrigerator warms up a little bit, the motor kicks on, it gets this desired temperature, it kicks off. Uh, they will not open the door of the refrigerator unless the, the motor is running so that their opening the refrigerator doesn't let heat in, which would then cause the motor to go on. You know, uh, to say nothing of unscrewing the light bulb inside oh, the refrigerator. Oh, the light bulb, yeah, that I've heard about. Now, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law got so tired of screwing the light bulb in and out, she took it out altogether. <laughs> okay. Ooh. All right. So as it says here, whether one adopts a comprehensive ban or a partial permission, it is worthwhile to study the halakhic issues involved in operating electronics on Shabbat. Uh, Mort, uh, could we go, I, it, it mentions uh, we, where we were before, the issue of keys and carrying, but if you've got an air of why can't you know what's the big deal at that point uh, uh, yeah i i can't remember where it is. no it's after this obviously after this one yeah um first full paragraph there it is yeah yeah why once you have set up an air of what, what, what's the issue about putting your keys in your pocket? There isn't. <laughs> this so is in spite of the fact that people still pin their keys to their pants. Or, or as Rabbi Musliaf used to do, put it on his tie clip. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, he's talking about if there is not a, an A roof, then, you know. Using okay. Okay, sorry. That's uh, yeah. No, if there is an a roof, then then um, you see we're going to come to the issue of going between domains. Um, All right. You know, takes care of that. Okay. So now let's get into defining malacha. First of all, looking at biblical sources, we see. The primary halachic vocabulary used to regulate Shabbat is that of malacha. The Torah emphatically prohibits all malacha on pain of death, but is vague about the definition of such activity. Um, you know, in the Torah, God commands Israel not to burn fire in all of its habitations, to stone to death a man who gathers firewood, and to not plow or harvest in the field. Jeremiah adds a ban on carrying from one domain to another in, in Nehemiah, admonishes the men of Judah for treading on wine presses and loading wares on Shabbat. Um, nevertheless, it is unclear from biblical text how many discrete actions are cumulatively included in the Malacha prohibition and how these activities are to be differentiated from other permitted behaviors. Okay. And th those that you just read are sort of like working job, I mean, you're a job and a vocation as opposed to certain other types of activities. It's almost like um, orthodoxy has, you know, built, built the fence around the Torah so wide with regard to work there's there's 
it's very difficult to establish. I mean, I guess they say <clears throat> you can't tell where the line is, so we'll just include everything. Um, no, not completely. Uh, what, I, what I need to point out here, yes, there's a lot of, and, and this particular paragraph, uh, it talks about, you know, occupations, you know, gathering firewood, um, plow, harvesting, etc. But notice it says, Jeremiah adds a ban on carrying from one domain to the other. Um, that, as we're going to get into, is a very critical distinction. Um, and it, they, the rabbis go into it at length. Um, but, but see, that's, that's going to be the whole issue. And that the Torah you know, talks about some specifically, specific actions. Uh, and we know it says, you know, the, uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and even though it, it says specific actions, how do we then draw generalities and universal statements based on, on these type of statements that we find in the Torah. Um, and, and this son, in the middle of the page, this is a uh, response to Doug's question. Yes. I'm just, uh, <clears throat> term, here you go, Doug. The term Malachi is employed in reference to God's creation to the, of the cosmos in Genesis and to Israel's construction of the tabernacle in Exodus. These associations imply there is something creative about Malacha. It is the language of creation for both God and for people. So, in, specifically in the construction of the tabernacle, that everything it, it says, you know, you shouldn't do Malacha, but Malacha is very, you know, detailed in terms of what activities were used to... Uh, <laughs> to build the tabernacle. So uh, therefore, anything that was done to uh, build the tabernacle was to consider uh, work that was prohibited on Shabbat. And you know, from these statements that I had that we read already, and the statements in the building of the tabernacle, we come up with the 39 prohibitions uh, of, or 39 aspects of Malacha that we find in the Mishnah, which uh, I think is coming up. By the way, that's why I put this file in, you know, in the chat because I'm just giving you some passages that I highlighted uh, and there's a lot in here. It really is. Uh, okay, um, here it says, modern Bible scholars have observed that the institution of Shabbat rose in prominence following the destruction of the first temple and came to be seen as the symbol of the entire covenant at that time. Whereas the festivals required a physical center for full ritual observance, the Shabbat could be observed anyway, anywhere, including in exile. Moreover, as Michael Fishbane has written, post-exilic ideologies saw in the destruction of the, sh sh the desecration of Shabbat, the principal reason for Judea's destruction and correspondingly believe in its rest reconsecration to be vital. All right. Uh, More? No. Yeah. I'm, I, I hate to, to digress. Could you, could you back up a little bit to the... I, I know you jumped on to the to the construction of the of the Mishkan, but there are two things going on in that statement, that, that highlighted statement that we looked at before. And it it talks about both the creation of the cosmos and the construction of the tabernacle. So that the question that comes up is what are the similarities, what are the parallels between those two things? Look, look a few lines down where it says, 
The type of creativity discussed here is one in which material reality is transformed rather than the creativity of song speech or other expressions of emotions and ideas. Now, I would, I would suggest there's another similarity here, which is that in both cases, you've gone from an activity associated with objects um, to a, an, an experience of God directly. What, what, what does God do when God rests? You know, what does God do when he's not resting? Um, he, he's creating, <laughs> he's doing question. things in the world. And when, he's, when, when, when God rests, he is being God. I'd suggest that, that when the Mishkan was completed, it, it presented the opportunity for the people um, to, as much as they can, experience God directly. And that the distinction here is the state of being um, that you're seeking to achieve rather than the exclusion of the activities. Okay, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I think, uh, wait, let me answer that in one second. I have an alarm going off in the other room and Carmi's not home. So let me just go turn that off. I'll be back in one second. Meanwhile, you can discuss Doug's question. <laughs> uh. Well, D Doug, is that what I was saying before that the, the emphasis seems to be sometimes on the outcome of the activity rather than the activity itself? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that's the case. And, and does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, well, if it, you're not it, you're not changing something physically, um, as opposed to like your your mind. You may be changing your thoughts. You may be coming up with an idea you didn't have before. But um, actually, a all the things that are described are physical changes. changes. Now, that doesn't necessarily answer the question, but <clears throat> because you, you know, somebody says, well, the light was off, you turned the light on, that's changing something. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the relationship to a thing that was in a certain condition before Shabbat, and then is changed during Shabbat. Well, so I think, I think that's exactly where we've ended up, that focus, David. Um, but I would suggest that, that the yardstick should be something like um, anything that promotes a, a state of being that, that approaches communion with God, if you will, uh, or an experience of the divine is not melacha. And anything that, that interferes with that, that changes your focus, is melacha. So if you were to open your iPhone that saved this file and start reading about the meaning of melacha and, and, and what to do and what not to do on Shabbat, while it's Shabbat, is that okay? Because you're trying to find the, the essence of what Shabbat is and what you shouldn't do, is that okay? <laughs> If you were to use, if you were to use this alternative yardstick that I'm suggesting, yeah, right. Um, if you flip a switch, you're I mean, changing the state of whatever is there, so that if you're causing electrons to flow, you're changing the state in the wiring or whatever transistors or whatever is there. Then that's malacha. But well, Doug, no, Doug, is, I, Doug is looking at the substance no, of what... I, I, first of all, that, that definition of Lacha, I think uh, we're going to stick away from. Um, it's defining it a little bit differently. But I would say that what Doug is suggesting is, in fact, the rationale... I'm going to call it rationale for the moment, for lack of a better word. Um, the rationale that a lot of people do use. Um, and I think, remember, we went, just went through the whole spectrum of how people look at, at halakha. 
And yes, if we would look at way to the right, I think people will reject uh, or will, would, would limit Doug's statement. Uh, and the more you go uh, to the left, they would absolutely agree with it. Um, <laughs> you can't have people, you know, and people have told me, you know, what I want to do on Shabbat is take a hike through the woods, perhaps take my, um, you know, my phone with me and, and listen to a symphony while sitting on the top of a beautiful ridge. That's my Shabbat. It's, it's, it's refreshing. It's, uh, it's, in, uh, it's rejuvenating. Um, even as, God, as Doug says here, it's, it's my connection with a, with a godly feeling, uh, however we want to you know, define that. Uh, and yes, it, it, it could be a definition of malacha. Uh, I, re I remember once hearing Rabbi Neil Gilman speak, and he was talking about Shabbat, what you could do or not do, and talking about driving on Shabbat. And he was saying, okay, if, if you're going to be driving to shul, because that's the only way you can get there, it's very far, you can't really walk there, th that's okay. Uh, is that okay? And then if that's okay, if on the way back you were visiting your elderly parents someplace and you wanted to stop and visit them, um, which was a, a nice thing to do, is, is that okay? And if on the way to the parents, he would just keep going like, you, you happened to stop at a place where there was something you meant to pick up on the day before, but you didn't. I mean, he just had this <laughs> one one addition to each one of these things and and it was interesting because you sort of look at that and you realize that it's extraordinarily hard to draw a line but i like i i, I like doug's you know doug's interpretation of this i think that well david the interesting thing about gilman's response is i don't necessarily agree with it if we're if we're again using this yardstick because if your intention in going to shul is to go and see your friends and hang out and have 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 a, a kiddish lunch, then the driving really shouldn't be permissible. Because it's it what what that reduces the notion of malachatu is is a question of kavana. Well, uh, Neil's answer is actually. Uh, based on the original teshuva of, of whether we the movement would allow driving, um, I, 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 and now I we got to go back. Now we got to go back and see how he voted on that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm pretty sure he was on the law committee at that time, um, but um, I mean, I, I think he's pointing out exactly the issue. Any type of issue that you have when you're defining, you know, you're doing any legal definition, um, you know, when when people when um, legislators enact a law or rabbis think of a teshuva, they basically they have certain criteria that they're looking at. They have <coughs> of something that they want the law to accomplish. Um, and, you know, I think it's physically impossible for humans to actually consider every infinite possibility that could go against a statement, a legal statement. Um, and, you know, so if the Teshuvah said you can drive, if you have to drive to get to Shul on Shabbat, it's okay, but only drive to the Shul and back. Uh, which is, I believe, what it says. So he said, well, I'm going to stop and see my parents. You know, that's part of my Shabbat. Uh, or maybe I'll leave my car at my parents and walk home from there. You know, well, I don't really, I need my car right after Shabbat. I better take it home. You know, one thing goes after the other. So, um, you know, we could go on and on and on with this question too, but because it's it's really a real it's a it's a real question and it's a vital one 
uh, and, you know, any of these, these um, rulings that we come up with, we can say, well, you could take it here, you could take it there. You know, what does throwing the switch do? Does it have the electrons moving within the wire? Is it causing the, uh, the generator that makes the electricity to work a little harder, uh, et cetera, and so forth? Um, we could keep on going. And, uh, and let me, you know, what I think I'd rather do is uh, go back here. I want to make a couple other points, and then, as I was sure we would need to do, um, no, this is this is even gonna get worse. Um, I think no. Where did I get up to? I was here. Uh, the rabbinic sources. Um, maybe just sum it up to this point, and we'll keep on going uh, with it. If, this may be a couple of weeks of going through all of this. Um, but even so, maybe I'll sum up with by saying this, that just our discussion today shows how difficult it is to come up with any type of definition of malacha. Um, and we haven't even got to shvut, which is the other aspect of defining Shabbat. Shavuot is rest. You know, it says you shouldn't do any work and you should rest on Shabbat. Um, basically, rest is defined as non-malacha. Uh, and you can see we're going to, we got a lot of vagueness. We have a lot of, of what ifs and taking it here, there, and everywhere else. And um, there's a lot to be said. Uh, okay. More one question: Is this the, the article that you that you're reading from and that you sent us has a bunch of links? Is there some place in this that you know of where those previous uh, committee uh, conservative committee on law, on, on standards um, took this up? You said there wasn't the earlier. First, I if there's a link, you know, a footnote here. Yeah, I didn't. It's, um, we can get to that. There, there are actually 20 pages of footnotes on this thing. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if there was a specific reference somewhere to that that we could. I, I, Here we go. See? Yeah. Oh, God. Yes. Some of those have, um, uh, you know, links to take you where. But uh, if you go on the, uh, I believe the web page of the Rabbinical Assembly okay. has, has, has links to those to Shuvot, which are available to the public. Um, I haven't directly been on there because, you know, they send us uh, summary statements every once in a while. I've been looking at some of that rather than going online. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of them should be available online. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, any other questions for today? I'm saying for today because we've got a whole bunch. <laughs> so far, so good. Thank you very much, Mort. Thank you, Mort. Yes, thank you. I, 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 you know, I'm assuming that everybody is, is digging into this and this is what we want to continue doing for a while. Yes. Oh, yeah. I find this interesting, fascinating. Thank you. Uh, please, if I'm getting off and hammering this too much, we can, there's other things we could get to, too. No, 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 I'd like to keep going through this. Yeah. All right. Um, I may have to bring up Halakha for the times from the five, five towns, what do you name it? They, <laughs> oh, by the way, um, I just want to mention, last night, um, we watched a movie that we found on uh, Amazon called The Code of Silence. Um, and it's a film that focuses on it's uh, some allegations of sexual abuse by the teachers in a yeshiva in Melbourne, Australia, mm. and how this one guy um, decided to come public with the abuse that he suffered mm. and how his parents backed him up. And when they reported the incidences to the authorities, um, 
they were excommunicated from the community. Wow. Um, it's a it's a very moving picture, uh, movie, and uh, uh, you know I, I recommend it. It's uh, the story I think is still ongoing, but it's a good movie. I I think more that um, this is Arlene. I think that they that the Philadelphia Jewish Film Festival showed that movie when it originally came out, and I agree with you. It was a very interesting movie. Yeah, I, um, thought I, I thought I had heard something about it. I know we didn't see it before, but yeah, it might have been. But it's available um, on Amazon. Um, and since it, it comes with Prime, uh, it was, it was no cost at that point. So, uh, so. Right. Um, tonight, for people who are interested in films, there is a, the Philadelphia Jewish Film Festival is, is um, uh, is doing a movie that I think they also showed once before. Um, and you can sign up online. Um, it's part of a four part series on um, the relationships between the Jewish and black communities. And um, tonight is with one of the guy, guys who marched with um, King. Yeah, I think his name Prince. is, pardon? Prince is- uh, Joachim Prince. Joachim Prince, yeah. Yeah, and I think I saw it before, and my recollection is it's a good movie, but I'm going to watch it again. Um, the movie just, they just, saying, just as you're saying that, I'm getting the email reminding me about it. Okay, and I would say that the movie they showed last week, if you can find it, it may be on Menashma's um, website, you have to pay for it separately, is a movie called Shared Legacies. Um, that was about the civil rights movement and primarily the civil rights movement in the 60s. It was that I had never seen before. It's apparently a new one. It's a it was a very good history. I, about thought, that. It was excellent. <laughs> I thought that movie was excellent. Pardon? It was excellent. It really uh, excellent. I think it gave a good balanced view between the stories of the blacks and the stories of the Jews. And I, I found that to be a very superb movie. I thought so too. I agree more. And, and, and I will say that it precipitated my sending an email yesterday to Alana Trachtman um, to see how she was doing. Um, they'll be back at the end of August and she's still busy working on her movie about the integration of um, Glen Echo Park in Washington, D.C. She needs to raise a lot of money to finish it. But they'll be back soon. Okay, good. I was actually wondering about that yesterday. You were talking about people in Israel. And yeah. I was wondering about it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks okay, for today. Take care. Bye. Bye. So long. Yeah, everybody. Time for the next meeting. <laughs>